I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Midweek Show. We're going to do the second chapter of Ivan Sanderson's book, uh, Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life. And bear with us, Jim Sower read it in two parts, uh, so it's not, you know, too big a deal. We'll just play the first part and then the second part with it. But um, So Tom, do you have anything to add before we play the story? Well, I do. I just want to say that uh, I looked into a little bit about Ivan Sanderson, and he, he really struck me as one of those hard-nosed, facts-based, uh, not a reporter, he was, he was a scientist, he was a biologist, but really was, uh, he did a lot of ground, as you said, a lot of groundbreaking research into this topic that John Green actually used uh, in his, you know, for some of his books. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that in the commentary, but... Um... Anything else before we get rolling on this? Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And if you like the show, click the like button and subscribe. It helps the algorithm. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so. There's a link in the description for Patreon. All right. Great job. All right, everyone. Remember, this is going to be in two parts, but they're going to play back to back. So stand by. Welcome. This reading is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. This reading, we thought we'd do something a little bit different. In times past, I have read you several short stories or a collection of short stories. Uh, today, we're going to be reading something with a little more sustainability. I'm going to read from Abominable Snowmen by Ivan T. Sanderson from his book. And uh, if you don't know who Ivan Sanderson was, he was one of the giants in the field of research concerning these creatures. And, uh, well, let me introduce you. He was a biologist with degrees in botany and ethnology who traveled the world studying and researching hominoids and unexplained phenomenon. He may indeed have coined the word cryptozoology, and in his later years he also pursued UFO and paranormal activities. And now let me begin reading from Abominable Snowmen by Ivan T. Sanderson, Legend Come to Life. This is the story of subhumans on five continents from the early Ice Age until today. And now his dedication in his book to Bernard and Monique Huvelman's and my own Alma, and also to the following. Today finds a surprising host of assorted students in this odd field, but also a few professional scientists whose labors I would like first to note, at the same time thanking them for their long-standing encouragement, constructive criticism, and many forms of direct help, not only in this book, but also in my other studies of similar matters. In addition to Dr. Bernard Huvelman's, who has become the doyen of the whole business, these are most especially Professor W. C. Osman Hill, presently prosector of the Zoological Society of London, Professor George A. Agagino, assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming, Professor Taizo Ogawa, Department of Anatomy, University of Tokyo, Professor B. F. Porshnev of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, Professor Quararo Gini, President of the Institut International di Sociology, Rome, Italy, and Dr. John Napier of the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine at the University of London, England. Dr. Valdemir Chernyevsky of Queen Mary's College, London, has lent me much invaluable advice. 
and Dr. Jorge Ibarra, director of the National Museum of Guatemala, has pursued more specific details for me in this country. There is, then, another category of students not primarily engaged in scientific pursuits, but without whose labors little would be known about this subject, and without whose generous help this book could not have been written. This class is headed by Tom Slick of San Antonio, Texas, whose work is more fully acknowledged in the course of my story. Next, J.W. Burns of San Francisco, who has spent over half a lifetime in pursuit of the Sasquatches, and John Green, newspaper publisher of Agassiz, British Columbia, on whose shoulders Mr. Burns' mantle has fallen. Then there is my old school friend, W.M. Gerald Russell, and Peter Byrne, who separately and together did so much to clarify A.B. Emsmary in the Himalayan region. In the same class is my friend and associate, Kenneth C. Cal Brown. In still another category is a devoted and more or less dedicated little band of my immediate associates. Foremost is my wife, who has worked with me for over a quarter of a century, in the field, in my researches, and on all my books, doing much more than merely typing and collating roomfuls of material. Next, I would like to acknowledge two of the most remarkable young men I have had the pleasure and honor of meeting in scholarship, Rabbi Yona N. Ibn Aaron and Umberto Orsi. Yona is the recipient of degrees from the University of Yemen and a philologist of remarkable knowledge and talents accredited to the U.N., who obtained his M.A. degree upon production of the first and only Basrai Aramaic lexicon. He is, as detailed later, conversant with all the basic dialects upon which the larger number of languages of eastern Eurasia are today founded. Umberto Orsi has given me vast assistance via his specialty, bibliographical research. He is not just a literary sleuth, but a true bloodhound when it comes to rescuing rare items from the mazes of modern libraries. Without his invaluable assistance, I would not have dared to issue this work. Then there is Jonah Lynch, who somehow reproduced all my maps outside of office hours in just two weeks. Then, too, our good friend Rizel Halpins, who gave great help on the manuscript, merely out of kindness and her interest in the subject. There come next three new friends who have given their own particular technical skills to immeasurably further this work, and I don't quite know how to thank them. They are, first, Lejubica Popovich and Benjamin Rothberg, both of Philadelphia, who translated some hundred thousand words of technical material from Russian originals of hitherto unpublished publications of the Special Commission of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Coming after these two stalwarts was Ethel Waugh, who transcribed their translations from tape recordings, including place names and goodness knows how many languages. To all of these, and particularly to Ben Rothberg, upon whom the greatest onus devolved, I hereby give my sincerest thanks. Actually, these three together accomplished a work of considerable significance in anthropology, which will, I hope, soon see the light of day in complete and technical form. I would like to say, also, that I have been the recipient of splendid guidance and encouragement from the Chilton Company, the book division, both as a whole and from all its departments. They have kept a fine old publishing tradition in a bright new setting, a novel experience, and most delightful one to a latter-day writer who has seldom enjoyed such cooperation in the past. Finally, there is another army of good people, many named in the body of the story, but many more are not aimed, who have furthered the cause of ABMS Murray, generally by coming out with their own stories in face of ridicule and censure, so extreme in some times to have resulted in loss of their jobs. These people are pioneers, if not on occasion actual martyrs. In their pursuit of truth and the disproof of official mendacity, prejudice, and stupidity, I can only pray that one day their fortitude will be rewarded with full popular and scientific recognition. Ivan
T. Sanderson. And now, the foreword, which was written by George A. Agagina. The possible existence of the Yeti Sasquatch and other abominable snowman forms has long been a point of conjecture among travelers, naturalists, and scientists. While most of this evidence is circumstantial and inconclusive as yet, it provides a tantalizing mystery filled with enough interest and promise to warrant the attention of both serious students and casual readers. In this book, Ivan T. Sanderson summarizes current world evidence regarding ABSMs, abominable snowmen, drawing from records and reports that are worldwide in scope and cover a broad period of time. For completeness, he discusses all prevailing views, both pro and con, ranging from highly plausible accounts to reports that border on the absurd. The result is as thorough an evaluation of all known ABSM sightings as could possibly be compiled at this time. My own approach to the ABSM problem was one of extreme skepticism. Three years ago, I dismissed all such evidence as either hoax or legend, and in hopes of a confirmation of this viewpoint, served as coordinator of laboratory research for several abominable snowman expeditions into the Himalayas. Today my skepticism is somewhat shaken, and I accept as plausible, perhaps even probable, the existence of the Yeti in the Tibetan Plateau, and view with growing interest the global sightings of similar creatures. Since my own research has been in connection with the Himalaya Yeti, I will restrict my comments to this area alone. If I accept the results of serological tests, analysis of feces for content and parasites, examination of hair, hide, and tracks, and evaluation of mummified Yeti shrine items, then I must support the existence of a large unknown animal, the Yeti, in the Himalayas. However, the following question once disturbed my acceptance of this conclusion. It is possible for any large animal to be sought systematically for over a decade, without a single specimen being captured or killed? For an example bearing on this question, I return to the Tibetan Plateau. Here in western Sichuan, China, on the very edge of the Tibetan border, a large animal, the giant panda, was once hunted unsuccessfully for over 70 years before one was captured alive. This research proves that a large animal can exist, yet elude the best efforts of professional collectors to secure one. The story behind this hunt is fascinating. In 1869, Abi Armad David, a noted French missionary, observed a strange bear-like skin in Sichuan province, located on the edge of the Tibetan Plateau. This skin, much like that of a modest-sized black and white bear, was the first tangible proof that the Baisheng, white bear, of Sichuan did actually exist. Excitedly, Father David, a longtime naturalist and conservationist, traveled to this animal's reported habitat, a high mountain bamboo forest, and engaged local hunters to secure a living specimen. In twelve days they returned. The hunters had captured a living giant panda, but since the animal proved troublesome in the traveling, it was dispatched to make transportation more convenient. Although Father David was disappointed that he had failed to secure a living animal, he shipped the remains to the Paris Museum, providing the first tangible evidence that the legendary Baisheng actually existed and could be caught in the Sichuan bamboo forests. Captivated by such evidence, several scientific institutions supported field teams staffed by professional collectors. The world waited to see which of the several well-equipped expeditions to Sichuan would capture the first living specimen. This was in 1869. By 1900, the world was still waiting. Scientific interest was great, for the once mythical Baisheng had been given the scientific name Alleropoda melanolicus, and a separate family of its own. In spite of professional excitement, no new giant pandas were even seen until 1915, 
and no new remains were obtained until 1929, when two sons of President Roosevelt, Theodore Jr. and Kermit, shot one out of a hollow tree. By this time, most zoologists had decided the panda was extinct, so that the Roosevelt shot, while killing a giant panda, at the same time punctured several scientific egos. Assured that the giant panda was not extinct, several new expeditions were outfitted. Each contributed to the threat of extinction by shooting giant pandas, but living animals still defied capture. In 1931, a specimen was shot for the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, and in 1934, another was killed for the American Museum of Natural History. Two other specimens were killed, one by Captain Brocklehurst in 1935, and the second by Quentin Young in 1936. In 1936, Floyd T. Smith managed to get a giant panda as far as Singapore before it died of natural causes. And finally, an experienced woman collector, Ruth Harkness, succeeded where the others had failed by capturing two live specimens, the first in 1937 and the second in 1938. Both animals survived the Trans-Pacific trip and were sent to the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. Within months, the animals had captured the imagination of American youngsters, and stuffed panda bears are still considered a necessary part of college dormitory life. In retrospect, the hunt for the giant panda serves as an important lesson in regard to animal collecting. From 1969 to 1929, a period of 60 years, a dozen well-staffed and well-equipped professional zoological collecting teams unsuccessfully sought an animal the size of a small bear in a restricted area. During this time, not a single specimen, living or dead, was obtained. The lesson is clear. The giant panda lives in the same general area and at the same general elevation, 6,000 to 12,000 feet, as the yeti. Yet, this animal remained hidden for over 60 years. The Yeti can well be a similar case. At any rate, one can no longer dismiss the Yeti just because it has eluded modern search for a single decade. While admittedly no living giant panda was captured during an intensive 70-year search, several animals were killed by gunfire during the last few years, 1929 through 1936 of that period, why don't we have similar reports of Yeti killings? The truth is, we do. But for the most part, these reports come from behind the communist curtain and cannot be substantiated. Nepal is the only country in the free world with the Yeti ABSM form, and here killing a Yeti is a criminal offense with severe penalties. As a result, violators remain secret and reports are all but impossible to trace. I have been asked if it is possible for modern science, fortified by great improvements in world transportation and communication, to miss completely authentic reports on the Yeti, if, indeed, such reports exist. It can be understood how the Baisheng could be mentioned in a 70th century A.D. Chinese manuscript, yet not be seen by any outsider until some 1,200 years later. This was a period of an isolated and mysterious Far East, the land of the dragon, Shangri-La, the Great Wall, and the unknown Oriental mind. The period from 1869 to 1929 was only relatively more progressive. Look how transportation has reduced our world since the time of the Model A Ford and the spirit of St. Louis. Look how communication has improved since the megaphone of Rudy Valley and the early talking pictures. Today our world is much smaller and nothing seems isolated anymore. Could we find a case similar to the search for the giant panda, which has occurred in more recent times? Well, such a case would be the discovery of living coelacanths in the Indian Ocean. Fossil remains of coelacanth fish forms have been found in rocks of the Devonian period some 300 million years ago and up to the end of the Cretaceous period 60 million years ago. No fossilized remains have been found in more recent deposits, and it was assumed that the coelacanth died out at this time. 
Fossil coelacanths were a most unique form of life, as they lived in several different aquatic environments. Their fossilized remains have been found under conditions that indicate that the living fish could be found in both salt and fresh water, including rivers, lakes, and even swamps. In addition to a diverse habitat, these fish had a worldwide distribution. It now seems indeed strange that no remains have been found of this fish in rocks of the past 60 million years, for there is no doubt that this fish never became extinct, and in fact exists in fair numbers today. In December 1938, a specimen of the long-extinct coelacanth was found in the fishnet of a British trawler working off the coast of East London in South Africa. Caught alive, the huge fish rolled steel-blue eyes and waddled about the ship deck on clumsy fins that were used like stubby legs. The fish bit the inquisitive captain and oozed oil from its heavy scales for three hours before dying. Identified only after decay had rendered the fleshy parts useless for scientific purposes, it proved to be a heavy disappointment for ichthyologist James Smith of Rhodes University, Grahamstown, South Africa. Fossil remains show skeletal structure, and the importance of the recent catch lay in the chance to study the unknown fleshy parts of the fish. Now, this was impossible. Professor Smith realized that if one such fish existed, others similar to it must also exist, and he began a 15-year search for a second living coelacanth. For the next decade and a half, he visited islands and coral reefs in the West Indian Ocean, asking, looking, fishing. Finally, in December 1952, a fishing trawler off the Anjun and Comoro Islands between Madagascar and the mainland of Africa caught another coelacanth. Prompt action by ichthyologist Smith allowed him to obtain and preserve this specimen in excellent shape. Then came the big shock. For 14 years, he had tracked down all leads, talked to countless fishermen without avail. Now, within the next two years, three more coelacanths were obtained, and there were indications that the native population in this part of the world had fished for and eaten these living fossils for several generations. Although not a common item in native diets, there is no doubt that, while Professor Smith dreamed of finding a second coelacanth, a dozen or more had probably been served and eaten. Here was an example where science, with all its modern improvements in communication and transportation, was unaware that what was to be one of the great discoveries of the 20th century had long been a simple item of diet for the native population. Even Professor Smith, active in the area of specifically after the coelacanth, was caught unaware. But... Who would think of looking in a fish market for a living fossil like a coelacanth? For a final illustration, let me turn to my own field of archaeology. Prior to 1926, a general belief was that the American Indian was post-glacial in age, and as a consequence, glacial strata were rarely examined by professional archaeologists. The few archaeologists who claimed to find cultural evidence were criticized for their ineptitude and then quickly dismissed. In 1846, a human pelvis was found with several ground sloth skeletons in Mammoth Ravine near Natchez, Mississippi. Before the century ended, positive association was demonstrated by a fluorine test. Yet not only was the discovery disregarded, but the actual bones were lost and the incident forgotten. All other finds met with a similar fate until the discovery in 1926 of the unique Folsom projectile points with the extinct glacial bison antiquus near Folsom, New Mexico. In three years' research, 19 Folsom points were found in direct association with the 23 extinct bison, and the antiquity of the Paleo-Indian was firmly established. Now the long-neglected glacial strata were examined. Archaeologists looked for additional Folsom sites wherever man, wind, or weather had scarred the surface of the land, exposing the glacial earth levels to the human eye. Within a decade of the Folsom, New Mexico discovery, 
Paleo-Indian sites were found from Alaska to Patagonia and from coast to coast. These sites had been exposed to the eye of man for decades, but they were only found after man was convinced that Ice Age Indians actually existed. Again, it shows that man must believe before he looks, and he must look before he finds anything. Important things may well be all around us, but we will never find them unless we look for them. Perhaps one reason why we haven't more definite information on ABSMs is because not enough people have actually looked for ABSMs long enough or with enough dedication. This foreword was written by George A. Agagino. Thank you for listening to this week's broadcast, and in further weeks we will bring you more from The Abominable Snowman by Ivan T. Sanderson, Legend Come to Life, and we will start reading the chapters about the story of subhumans on five continents from the early Ice Age until today. Please join us again, and thank you for listening. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Chevening and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Last week, we left you halfway through Chapter 2, Ubiquitous Woodsmen. In the novel by Ivan T. Sanderson, Abominable Snowmen, the story of subhumans on five continents from the early Ice Age until today. The opening gambit was a sworn statement made by a highly respected lumberman, who had also been most successful as a timber cruiser and prospector, named Mike King. This gentleman had had to penetrate an isolated area in the north of Vancouver Island in 1901 alone, because his Amerindian employees refused to even enter it on any account, but mostly because they had said that it was a territory of the wild men of the woods. From other accounts, Mr. King, it seems, that he was not a man to be diverted from essential business routine by such stories, but that he had a profound respect for the local natives because they had guided him to a reasonable fortune on more than one occasion simply by their real knowledge of the country and the timber that grew in it. Some days after penetrating this wild area, Mr. King topped a ridge and spotted below a creature squatting down by a creek washing some kind of roots and arranging them in two neat piles beside him, or her, on the bank. This should be compared with the specific remarks made by Mr. Ostman, Chapter 3, on the same subject. In my interview with Mr. Ostman, he stressed the collection of roots by the creatures and even named the plant most chosen, also the careful washing and stacking of these. Perhaps he got the notion from reading this account, but personally I doubt it. King's natural instinct was to raise his rifle and sight, for the creature was large, covered in reddish-brown fur, and thus potentially dangerous. By the time the fact that brown bears don't wash roots and stack them up had penetrated, he realized that he had some kind of humanoid in his sights, and he lowered the rifle. The creature took off, running like a man, and, as Mr. King later reported, his arms were peculiarly long and used freely in climbing and brush-running, i.e. scrambling on all fours through scrub. King descended the slope and inspected the spore left by the departed one and noted that it was distinctly human foot, but with phenomenally long and spreading toes. On reading the original account from an old clipping to a company of Easterners some years ago, I heard somebody murmur, And so endeth the first lesson. And so indeed. For Although that statement has been repeatedly recounted, and Mike King has been repeatedly said to have elaborated, no further direct quotes appear to be extant. This is the way that unexpected things happen. I know from the few that I have experienced. You are not prepared for them, 
by the time you have managed to bring your senses to bear upon them, they are up and away, and you are left gaping, with a blurred impression all around, a single vivid centerpiece. What more can you add unless you want to be a tattler? My king apparently had both the decency and the common sense to say what he had to say, and then shut up. The next lot to have a similar encounter in 1904 were out hunting near Great Central Lake on Vancouver Island. Their names were J. Kincaid, T. Hutchins, A. Crump, and W. Buss, four citizens of Qualicum. They were apparently beating the bush and put up what they afterward described as a boy ABSM that was covered with brown hair but had long head hair and a beard. This is a very odd report in that it otherwise crops up only once or twice in all the accounts of ABSMs and is categorically contrary to all the other reports by everybody who has alleged that he or she has seen these creatures at close range. The third classic report is dated 1907 and was made by the captain and crew of the coastal steamer Capilano on their return from a routine cruise during which they had called at a small landing named Bishop's Cove. There, they said, the entire Amerindian population had come charging aboard begging for asylum or outright emigration due to a huge, monkey-like, human-shaped creature that had been clam-digging along their beach for a number of nights in succession and which gave vent to most disturbing high-pitched howls. These people readily identified the creature, but insisted that it had moved into their territory with its family, if not its whole clan, and that it would not brook any interference by a few poorly armed humans. The comments on this report are rather illuminating as they display a curious acknowledgment of the presence of such wild men, and the fact that, while they are accepted as being basically peaceable, and known to mind their own business, and while they avoid organized men in masses, they tend to adopt a nasty tone when it comes to hunting and collecting rights, and appear then to regard the Amerinds as interlopers and a nuisance. In 1907, however, the attitude of even the British toward real primitives was going through a peculiar phase. Halfway between the concept of the worthless native and that of the noble savage, the Amerinds had proved an unreliable labor force, while certain other non Europeans had turned out to be far too civilized for rank exploitation. The idea of really primitive creatures had not yet been abandoned, and everybody was still undecided just how to behave toward them. The thought that we might be dealing with sub-hominids did not, of course, occur to anybody professing any education. After all, Darwin was hardly cold as of then. But it remained in no way illogical to the uneducated, and it was played on by the press. Now, this may in some measure account for the solemnity with which a discovery made in 1912 was greeted. I got this report from Mr. Burns, mentioned above. It came to him from the principal, a Mr. Ernest A. Edwards, who states that he was residing in Sheshwap, B.C., at the date, and that he and his wife had unearthed on the small island of Neskane, a little way off the coast, a human skeleton that they found protruding from the bank of a river. The location was noted for its abundance of arrowheads of Amerindian origin. The skeleton is stated to have measured from skull to ankle seven feet six inches, so with feet and scalp the person must have been eight feet tall. Mr. Burns received this information in a letter from Mr. Edwards in 1941, and this included the further comments that I, together with my wife, examined the jaw, the teeth were of huge size, but in perfect condition, no cavities noticeable. The jawbone was so large it would span my face easily at the cheekbones. Together with the help of Indians, I crated it and shipped it to Wrexham Museum 
R-E-X-H-A-M, North Wales, England, where I believe it still is. In his acknowledgement, the curator of the museum was greatly astonished, remarking, among other observations, that it was hard to believe such jaws and teeth existed in human beings. The receipt of such intelligence, as this naturally prompts an almost fiendish, Ho, ho! What is this? on the part of any reporter. So I wrote to the curator of the museum specified and got the following reply from the librarian of the town of Wrexham, W-R-E-X-H-A-M, and not Wrexham, R-E-X-H-A-M, where there was no such town in Wales or anywhere else in Great Britain. With regard to your query, I have checked the minutes of this establishment, i.e. the Museum and Public Library, for the years 1912, 1913, and 1914, and there is no mention of the receipt of a skeleton. Yours sincerely, Clifford Harris, FLA. Reports of the discovery of skeletons of giant humans or humanoids are extremely numerous and have been coming in from all over this continent for many years. They constitute a subject of their own, which I have endeavored to pursue for a long time now, but I regret to have to say, without any success. One and all have just evaporated like this, but I must admit, very often within the portals of some museum which had acknowledged receipt of the relic, there is the famous story of the forty mummified giants in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, of the giants and giant coffins in some unnamed cave in Utah, of others dug up in a peat bog in West Virginia and allegedly shipped to the Smithsonian, and of others preserved in sundry small county museums in Nevada. I have voluminous correspondence on file on these items, but I have never yet managed to obtain sight of any single bone. This is odd because human giants are not really terribly rare. I have seen it stated that there are several thousand men over seven feet tall living today in the United States, whereas such persons in the past would probably have been regarded with some awe and might be expected to have been accorded rather special burial, so augmenting our chances of unearthing them. The matter of skeletal remains of ABSMs is, of course, of first importance, and second only to the procurement of a whole living specimen. The chance of unearthing a skeleton of one is not quite so unlikely as one might suppose, for it now transpires that very primitive peoples indeed seem to have performed deliberate interments, if not only to clear away refuse from the cannibalistic meal in a cave. Some ABSMs might well be or have once been at such a level of cultural development, and it is constantly reported by the Amerins in this area that their peculiar local variety indulged something akin to hibernation, or at least winter inactivity equivalent to that of the local bears, and that they do this in caves. This presents a dubious aspect of these traditions, however, because In the absence of limestone strata in the area, caves are rarities. Nonetheless, there are caves and volcanic rocks of certain kinds, and some have been alleged to have been found in the mountains around Harrison Lake. There is one story of such that pertains to ABSMs. This again I got from Mr. J. W. Burns. It goes as follows and comes from the Amerin named Charlie Victor, a resident of Chilliwack on the lower Fraser. The first time I came to know about these people, the local ABSMs, known as Sasquatches, I did not see anybody. Three young men and myself were picking salmon berries on a rocky mountain slope five or six miles from the old town of Yale. In our search for berries, we suddenly stumbled upon a large opening in the side of the mountain. This discovery greatly surprised all of us, for we knew every foot of the mountain, and never knew nor heard there was a cave in the vicinity. Outside the mouth of the cave there was an enormous boulder. We peered into the cavity but couldn't see anything. We gathered some pitchwood, lighted it, 
and began to explore. But before we got very far from the entrance of the cave, we came upon a sort of stone house or enclosure. It was a crude affair. We couldn't make a thorough examination, for our pitch wood kept going out. We left, intending to return in a couple of days, to go on exploring. Old Indians, to whom we told the story of our discovery, warned us not to venture near the cave again, as it was surely occupied by a Sasquatch. That was the first time I heard about the hairy men that inhabit the mountains. We, however, disregarded the advice of the old men and sneaked off to explore the cave, but to our great disappointment found the boulder rolled back into the mouth and fitting it so nicely that you might suppose it had been made for that purpose. This story seems to me to have a certain ring of truth about it, and the idea of using a boulder as a door, either for protective purposes or for concealment of a breeding chamber, is not in any way illogical or impossible. There is, however, it should be pointed out, a modern tendency to, as it were, chase anything elusive back into caves, and especially wild men. Probably because of all that has been written, from archaeological texts to comic books about cavemen. The majority of primitive hominids did not live in caves, simply because the number of caves available was, except in a few special areas, very limited. Further, they may have first entered them to get away from either heat or rain as much as from cold. Yet the remains of early men and animals are better and more readily preserved in cave floors than out in the open, while locating open-air camp sites is very chancy. The idea that men went through a cave-living phase all over the world has therefore gained wide acceptance. Sasquatches could just as well hole up in ice caves made by themselves in deep snow, as some bears do, but caves should be searched most diligently for remains or other evidence of their occupation. It was not too far away from this alleged cave site that the next encounter of which we have record, and that is documented, sworn to, and witnessed by more than one person, took place in 1915. A statutory declaration of this was sworn to in September of 1957 by one of the participants, Mr. Charles Flood, of Westminster, British Columbia. This goes as follows. I, Charles Flood of New Westminster, formerly of Hope, declare the following story to be true. I am 75 years of age and spent most of my life prospecting in the local mountains to the south of Hope, toward the American boundary and in the Chilliwack Lake area. In 1915, Donald McRae, and Green Hicks of Agassiz, British Columbia, and myself, explored an area over an unknown divide, and on the way back to Hope, near the Holy Cross Mountains, Green Hicks, a half-breed Indian, told McRae and me a story. He claimed he had seen alligators at what he called Alligator Lake, and wild humans at what he called Cougar Lake. Out of curiosity, we went with him, he had been there a week previous looking for a fur trap line. Sure enough, we saw his alligators, but they were black, twice the size of lizards in a small mud lake. A while further up was Cougar Lake. Several years before, a fire swept over many square miles of the mountains, which resulted in large areas of mountain huckleberry growth. Green Hicks suddenly stopped us and drew our attention to a large, light brown creature about eight feet high, standing on its hind legs, standing upright, pulling the berry bushes with one hand or paw toward him, and putting the berries in his mouth with the other hand or paw. I stood still, wondering, and McRae and Green Hicks were arguing. Hicks said, It is a wild man, and McRae said, It is a bear. As far as I am concerned, the strange creature looked more like a human being. we seen several black and brown bear on the trip, but that thing looked altogether different. Huge brown bear are known to be in Alaska, but have never been seen in southern British Columbia. 
this document brings up two questions that I should discuss briefly forthwith. The first is the matter of the law. As I have already said, we in this country do not have much respect for this aspect of human organization, and often tend to the observation that laws are only made to be broken. This is not so in some other countries, however, and the Canadians have an intense respect for their laws and for authority in general. Canadians will scoff at the suggestion that one of their countrymen is more likely not to lie before a justice of the peace than an American, but it is nonetheless a fact that a Canadian is more likely to make such a deposition of his veracity and has been called in question and or he wants to assert his sincerity. Also, he will think longer and more carefully about his statement if made before established authority, because, should anything he say therein be mendacious or thereby cause any distress or harm to others, he will be held fully accountable. Thus, these sworn statements and others that follow have a rather strong implication. The other matter is the introduction of an almost classic red herring. As I explain at greater length in chapter 19, an inexplicably high percentage of all esoteric investigations turn up other unexpected and apparently unrelated matters that are often just as weird, if not more so, than the original object of pursuit. In this case, the matter of alligators is quite extraordinary and quite beyond my comprehension. Alligators, per se, are only two in number, one species being indigenous to the Mississippi Valley and around the Gulf Coast of Florida, the other to the yangtze Kiang Valley of China. The term alligator has, however, become a colloquialism for all the crocodilians, and it is also applied in some countries to various lizards that spend most of their time in fresh water. Popular names are also very dangerous in that they become displaced in the most outrageous manner, such as the designation of a species of tortoise in Florida as a gopher, when that is the name for a group of small mammals otherwise called ground squirrels. Reptiles are, however, cold-blooded, and the existence of an aquatic one in even southern British Columbia would be unlikely, to say the least. Yet there is a species of salamander, an amphibian named Batrachochiceps, found in Alaska, and the giant salamander of the mountain streams of Japan is customarily iced in every winter. The mere mention of such a creature as an alligator in this story tends to cast doubt upon its other features, but then who is to say what can and cannot be? There is volcanicity in the area, and there might thus be hot or warm springs and lakes there, also, at some time, one or the other of the present-day species of alligator must have gotten over from either China to the Mississippi or vice versa. The only route for such an emigration is over the Bering Straits, thus passing through what is now British Columbia along the way. This matter of volcanicity in hot springs brings us to another really quite fabulous item of Canadian ABS Emery. This is the matter of the lower Nahani area of the Northwest Territories. If you go up to the western part of the Northwest Territories, you will sooner or later be told about the place where banana trees have been grown. Now, this sounds quite wacky, but if you pursue the matter diligently, you will learn that in the area of the junction of Liard and South Nahani Rivers, see Map 1, Lying against the vast mountain barrier which cuts our entire continent from the mouth of the Mackenzie River on the Arctic Sea to Veracruz on the Gulf of Mexico, abutting on to the central plains like a monstrous wall, there is a volcanic area where hot springs are found. There have been mission stations along the Liard for over a century, and it is quite true that at these magnificent vegetables are grown out in the open in the brief but intense summer. Also, they have been raised indoors, and among these vegetables have been a number of banana trees. However, this area, which lies at the south end of the vast Mackenzie Range, 
has long been one of myth and fantasy. The reports emanating from there cannot better be summed up than by quoting a column from a publication named Doubt, the periodical of the Fortean Society of New York. It was founded by the late author Tiffany Thayer, in conjunction with several other notable persons such as Ben Hecht, in memory of and to carry on the work of Charles Fort, that assiduous collector of borderline reports for so many years. This reads, in part, when speaking of an expedition said to have been organized to visit the area, This valley, number one legend of the Northlands, has as its background stories of tropical growth, hot springs, head-hunting mountain men, caves, prehistoric monsters, wailing winds, and lost gold mines. Actual fact certifies the hot springs, the wailing winds, and some person or persons who delight in lopping off prospectors' heads. As for the prehistoric monsters, Indians have returned from the Nahani country with fairly accurate drawings of mastodons burned on rawhide. The more recent history began some 40 years ago, circa 1910, when the two McLeod brothers of Fort Simpson were found dead in the valley and reportedly decapitated. Already the Indians shunned the place because of its mammoth grizzlies and evil spirits wailing in the canyons. Canadian police records show that Joe Mulholland of Minnesota, Bill Espler of Winnipeg, Phil Powers, and the McLeod brothers of Fort Simpson, Martin Jorgensen, Yukon Fisher, Annie Lafert, one O'Brien, Edwin Hall, Andy Hayes, an unidentified prospector, and Ernest Savard have perished in the strange valley since 1910. In 1945, the body of Savard was found in his sleeping bag, head nearly severed from his shoulders. Savard had previously brought rich ore samples out of the Nahani. In 1946, prospector John Patterson disappeared in the valley. His partner, Frank Henderson, was to have met him there, but never found him. The head-hunting mountain men are alleged locally and for a great distance around stretching to the limits of the mountain forest toward Alaska, east to northern Manitoba, and south all the way to the lower Fraser and beyond, to be ABSMs of the Sasquatch type, and with all its characteristics, such as winter withdrawal, occasional bursts of carnivorousness, and so forth. I also have reports in the form of private letters of similar creatures from all across the Northwest Territories, just south of the tree line, and again in northern Quebec province. This is somewhat irksome matter, as I have been unable to obtain any casts of footprints or other physical evidence from these regions, nor even sworn statements as yet. The reports are categoric and specific. Those from northern Manitoba are second-hand only, and from Amerindian informants via white men who have hunted there for many years in succession. Those from Quebec have puzzled me for years. I have constantly heard about them, but have only three pieces of paper to show for my exhaustive and prolonged inquiries and appeals. These are all letters from American summer visitors on serious hunting and camping trips by canoe, guided by professional Amerindian trappers and hunters. All three are substantially identical, and all give somewhat similar accounts of events in widely separated places. One is from a lone man a business executive from Chicago. One is from a party of four men of assorted professions who have hunted for years on their annual vacations together. The third is from the father of a family of four, three grown sons and a then teenage daughter. In each case, a tall, very heavily built, man-shaped creature with bullet head and bull neck and clothed all over with long, shiny black hair, with very long arms, short legs, and big hands, is said suddenly to have appeared on the bank of a river in which the party was quietly fishing. On one occasion, the creature is said to have carried off some fish left on a rock on the bank. 
On another, it chased the Amerindian guide out of the woods and into his canoe, and then waded some distance out into the water after him. The family party seemed to have become fairly familiar with two of the creatures over a period of several days. They say they constantly prowled around their camp and showed themselves among the trees whenever they went out in the canoes. One seems to have shown signs of chasing the girl on one occasion, but the father told me they gained the impression that this seemed to be more through curiosity than menace. Two of the Amarins are said to have asserted that they and their people knew the creatures quite well, and that there were quite a lot of them in those forests. The other guide, who was chased, appeared to be scared almost witless, and swore that the thing was some form of spirit or devil. However, it smashed branches and hurled stones, it is reported. I am frankly stymied over these reports. Two of the writers asked that I withhold their names in perpetuo, as they did not want reports to become known to their business associates. The third man I never traced. It was many months before I could get to the places from where the people wrote, and although I traced two of them, they all stopped answering my letters, and I left with nothing to follow up. This is an almost chronic condition of laborers in the vineyards of ABS Emory. People almost all just dry up in time. Of course, many probably write in the first place by way of a joke or just to see how gullible the inquirer is. But not all are of this ilk. Many people also, I believe, take fright in the possibility of ridicule or even become alarmed about their own sanity after they have once gotten something so unusual off their chests. Others, again, either consider the matter explained or just don't want it explained. It takes years of work to get at the facts, and this is rendered almost futile when one is dealing with a new locale that is only just being penetrated by civilized people. The ABSM tradition extends all across Canada, but it is concentrated in southern British Columbia, probably because that was the first area opened up and is still being probed from all around. This is the end of the reading of Chapter 2. Thank you for listening. All right, we're back. Folks, we don't really have any other chapters read for us yet, so uh, I know we did the first chapter and we, we've done the second chapter. We're hoping to get more read so we can break some more of this down because Sanderson really had a lot of great information in that book. And uh, and actually, as Tom mentioned in the, in the intro, um, his book, this book we're talking about, uh, Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life, was published in 1961. And it predates John Green's first book by seven years. So in this second chapter, there are several stories that are in there that Green actually used in his books later, and uh, which is interesting. And for those who may not know, Roger Patterson's book uh, from 1966, which also predated Green's first book <laughs> by two years. Green's first book on the track of the Sasquatch was in 1968. So Patterson... A lot of these guys knew each other or contacted each other for information. So Green used much of um, the stuff from Sanderson and then Patterson. And, and John Green told me this personally. He said that Patterson, he let him go through his files. And that's where Patterson got the information for his book. So I'm going to start this off. Um, there's, a, there's a piece in here. And for those who have a copy of Sanderson's book, if you go to page 36 and 37... Um, there's a very interesting piece here because Green in one of his books, and I wished I could remember which one or if, I, if it was Green's book, I'm thinking it is, I'll have to try to look it up. But there was a story that I, I've mentioned a few times on past shows where uh, from Green's material or whoever's it was, there was a couple that used to go prospecting on their vacations. And they were on this location uh, in British Columbia and had gone in by canoe. And when they came out to their canoe to leave, they found this uh, partially decomposed corpse near the lake shore or the edge of the water, where, wherever it was they were. And there was some discussion between the wife and the husband about whether they should take any of it back. 
the husband argued that he didn't want to because they had a lot of stuff in the canoe and they didn't really have any room for anything else. And the wife really wanted to take it apart, so she smuggled the jawbone into one of the packs. And as the story went, it sat on the mantel place for 14 years. People had come over, they could place the thing completely over their face, and then the house burnt down and the jaw was lost. But now here's this story. Uh, this is from... Um, it was a discovery made in 1912. And they actually list the people's names here. And I, I don't remember if the other information had the people's names or not. But uh, this was from J.W. Burns. And it says that um, there was a Mr. Ernest A. Edwards who stated that he was residing at, and I'm going to blow this, it's Shushwap, S-H-U-S-H-W-A-P, British Columbia, at that date. And that he and his wife had unearthed on a small island of Niskane, a little way off the coast, a human skeleton that they found protruding from the bank of a river. The location was noted for its abundance of arrowheads of uh, Native American origin. The skeleton is stated to have measured from skull to ankle joints, 7 feet 6 inches. So with feet and scalp, the person, quote-unquote, must have been 8 feet tall. Mr. Burns received this information from Mr. Edwards in 1941, and this included the further comments uh, that I, together with my wife, examined the jaw. The teeth were of huge size, but in perfect condition. No cavities notable. The jawbone was so large, it would span my face easily at the cheekbones. Together with the help of Indians, I created it, or crated it, I'm sorry, and shipped it to Wrexham Museum, North Wales, England, where I believe it still is. And that would be interesting if that was actually in that location. I'm sure people have attempted to find out. But uh, very similar story to the other one. Any thoughts, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. I, I and I picked up on that. It was it was similar enough that at first I thought maybe it was the same story. I, I did too, but there's actually quite a few differences. Yeah, yeah, there really are. And, you know, you re, I mean, you read into it for just, a moment and you realize well wait a second this this is a whole different account yeah and I, I was thinking too i thought oh man that was i got it from this book but then i thought no the details are too different yeah and plus they shipped it off to england right and the and the other story the house burnt down and the jaw was lost in the fire yeah exactly so interesting and again it it just goes back to you know we have an anthropologist john that we have on from time to time. And, you know, he's talking about the bones of these mm -hmm. things. He said there could be bones sitting in dusty boxes in basements of universities, oh, you know, yeah. in the anthropology department. And I can so, tell you, I can tell you firsthand, and I think I mentioned it before in previous shows, that my first year in college, I, I was really interested in anthropology and archaeology. And I went to my, uh, my advisor, who was the head of the, the anthropology department, and I asked him, if I could volunteer to do work in the lab or wherever. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, we can always use a hand in the lab. So, you know, be aware of what you ask for. Because my buddy Ron and I, we'd sit in there and we processed, you know, clamshells from uh, from garbage sites from Native American, you know, prehistoric sites. <laughs> and you sit there and clean them and you, you number them and you put them in a box. But the same is true with bones and other pieces of things that come out of, you um, you know, test pits or, or archaeological digs, the full digs. And um, and they get, you know, if they don't, nobody knows what it is, it gets stuck in a box and, you know, it gets clean, it gets labeled, and it could sit there for, who knows, for an eternity. And, and that way it was explained to me because I asked one time, I said, well, what happens with all this stuff? And he says, well, you know, state law says that we have to do this and we, we have to maintain them in perpetuity. And, um, uh, until somebody comes along and decides they want to take an interest in them. Otherwise, they just sit here. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize the state law actually mandated that you keep it in per perpetuity. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it were fed, some kind of federal regulations, too, but that's the way yeah. it was it, with archeo archaeological items. They have to be kept. Yeah, and I know that's kind of how it is with when you, if you stumble across something, uh, bones or Indian artifacts or anything like mm -hmm. that, you have to get a hold of the uh, state archaeologist. They send somebody out, 
and yeah, the rest the rest is history. Oh, you know, even the Forest Service they hire anthropologists and archaeologists. Uh, I fought forest fire one year, and uh, they told everybody, "Well, don't pick arrowheads up if you find them, because you know they have to be reported to the their local archaeologist who would come out and collect them up." Yeah, that's true. And there's actually a guy that I watch on YouTube who goes out and and he finds these historic sites and to his credit he'll pick up he'll look at he'll film uh you know typically uh, arrowhead and Mm -hmm. then he'll place it right back where he found it the way he found it say now here it is it's for the next person to enjoy right right so the whole point of that is you know like you said there could be things in boxes you know with dust on them that have been there forever and might be there forever so what, so what did you pick out of this chapter that people might be uh, interested oh, in? Oh, there's there was a lot of things. It's a very, I mean, the whole book is rich, but this chapter was, uh, chapter two is very rich. 1864, Alexander uh, Caulfield was doing a survey, and they reported that hominids, or these hairy humanoids, hurled rocks at, at the survey party. And where and have this we was heard an that before? Thing. <laughs> have we heard that before just a time or two it's that repeating pattern and, and you said that was 1864 right yeah 1864 yeah, it's so a long long noted behavior yes think american civil war and up in british columbia while the towards the end of the american civil war going back that far they're running into these things right absolutely interesting well any other pieces you want to bring up? We um, we don't need a lot of com- commentary in this one, folks, because we went a little bit long. But um, anything else, Tom? I think that's it for me. I mean, really, just listen to the story, and it's fast. There's just it's rich. There's a lot of information there. It is, and again, and I, I encourage people if they want to, you know, read this book, uh, even though it's dated 1961 and written previous to that, of course. Uh, there's a lot of pertinent pertinent information in that book. So having said that, folks, um, hope you enjoyed the segment, and uh, stay tuned for the weekend show. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open.